Hello. Good afternoon. Hello to all viewers. Welcome to this 20th episode of the ARD webinar series. I'm Doris Obrecht. I'm talking to you from near Vienna in Austria. EAD is the European Association of Development Research and Training Institute. It has been running these webinars since 2017. Our focus is on engaging with researchers, practitioners, and all people who are interested in thinking a little bit outside of the box when it comes to development issues. The title of this today's webinar is Generational Transfer of Disadvantages and Extreme Poverty. Coming from a study in Bangladesh, our speaker today focuses on the understanding of how inter- and intragenerational bargains generate extreme poverty and implicate an extreme poor future. So I would like to introduce you to our speaker today, Obasim Akram. He is a PhD candidate at the Örebro University in Sweden. In his research, he focuses on issues of extreme poverty, social protection and policy, and aging and gender, to name just a few. Obasim Akram has a long professional career as a development practitioner with experience to work for organizations like RAS or Plan International, Oxfam, and also the European Union delegation to Bangladesh. Avasim, welcome you and thank you so much for taking the part in this webinar and for sharing your time with us. Um, thank you, Doris, for introducing me. And thank you also to European Association of Development Research for organizing this webinar. After this introduction, we will hear Avasim's presentation, which will take about I think about 30 minutes. After that, I will ask some questions and then we will have plenty of time for, of dis for discussion and debate with you. Without any further delay, I want to give the floor to Oversim to give us insights into his research on extreme poverty and generational bargain in Bangladesh. With one question before from me, before we start, um, because I went through your through your papers and articles, and the term generational bargain was not clear to me from the beginning. So maybe you can explain this term. I suspect that many people might not have heard it before, so it would be helpful for us to explain it in the context of your work. Uh, thank you, Doris, for this introduction and all the details. And I think, um, uh, in the in the presentation, we will definitely get to know about, more about this concept. And it, in fact, the objective of the presentation is to know about this concept a little bit more and to understand the extreme poverty within that light. So I think the whole presentation will be uh, shedding light on uh, that kind of um, aspects also. Now, uh, before I start, um, uh, I want to make a disclaimer that this paper research has been published recently uh, in the European Journal of Development Research. And this has been co-authored with uh, Dr. Mathilde Matrot from University of Bath and uh, the Professor Thomas Tank from uh, Orbe University in Sweden. Now let's move to the presentations and uh, let me start with the background uh, behind the research. And I think everyone will agree that pockets of entrenched poverty persist everywhere in the world and even in uh, societies where there is macroeconomic growth are uh, sustaining. And in all these cases, this poverty is known as either chronic poverty, ultra poverty, or extreme poverty. One of the distinct features that has been agreed in all the definitions of this poverty is this is intergenerationally transmitted. This is that means it's transfer from one generation to the other. And this transfer process has remained underanalyzed. Now let's come to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a country with 170 million population, and in the Last few decades, the country has really made some good progress in terms of poverty eradication, but still there are 20 million people who, are li who live below the poverty line, which is around 13% of the total population. If you see in terms of the percentage, this might really look promising, but if you, if you look at in terms of the absolute count, this is really huge. The 20 million people are living below the poverty line, and this number will definitely, in terms of absolute number, will increase in the future, this is because the progress rate has been slowed or stagnated at one point. And with this background, I think it ultimately raised some important policy and program concerns for all who are working in the development field, particularly on extreme poverty. 
and these are why do some people stay poor why the children of the poor people are also likely to be poor and why do people end up poor when they really age now let's try to um, uh, frame uh, our uh, concept of generational transfer of disadvantages as you know that poverty reduction is one of the global priority for all the development actors and which has been opted through millennium development goals and recently in the sustainable development goals what happened is uh, what it, whatever we have understood about this intergenerational concept of poverty is mostly understood from the finance centric understanding of uh, of the poverty like income expenditure consumption this kind of thing and there is there are a lot of critics and um, um, critics that has come forward um, uh, accusing that this kind of uh, understanding is really flawed, misleading, superfluous, and easily manipulated. Now, even if we agree that economic well-being is really an important factor to distinguish between those who are poor and who are not, can economic well-being still be measured by simply those kind of indicators? And ultimately, we have seen there are increasing focus on the sophisticated uh, poverty estimation techniques and other things. And that in, in doing this, they are really neglect, uh, neglecting the lived experience of the uh, poverty. And ultimately, what happens, it leads to a failure to differentiate, uh, differentiate outcomes and manifestation of poverty from its causes. And here comes the alternative approaches to understand poverty. And uh, like San uh, Martha Nussbaum, uh, they're one of those pioneers where they have tried to stress more on the immateriality and relational dynamics of poverty. And moving away from this uh, materialistic position, uh, uh, materialistic position, Sen and others, they are really trying to focus on the entitlement issue, the concept of freedom, the capabilities functioning, and so on. And they have put these issues in the center of the poverty analysis. In their understanding, what we have come to know that poverty is composed of social relations enabled by a set of entitlements contingent on social and cultural configuration. And in this sense, poverty really needs to be understood within a political economic context. Now, this also necessitates the analysis of the dynamic interaction between the systemic uh, and the idiosyncratic risks. This is because the extreme poor are really highly vulnerable to systemic and the relational poverty as mentioned by uh, some scholars. And these risks should be understood in the light of previous experiences and the process of exploitation and exclusion that are specific to these households, which are two compatible phenomena. And from 2000, uh, we have seen that there are growing interest um, among, uh, among, um, among the scholars to understand how poverty is really reproduced from one generation to the next, exploring from the lived experience of the poverty as we have seen from the work of the Chronic Poverty Research Center and some other organizations. And what we have come to know from this research that this transfer occurs within the boundaries of the household during the parent's life cycle through accumulation of a set of exposures to opportunities, constraints and disadvantages which are then inherited by the child of the family. Although part of this process can be said conscious and intentional, but largely it remained less detectable and deliberate. Therefore, intergenerational poverty is not only representing an outcome, which is child poverty, but also represents a cause, the oldest poverty ultimately. And these bargains can be associated with the transmission of disadvantages, liabilities, and inequalities between generations, which take place through the transfer of assets, skills, education, or health-related disadvantages. And, and this is also true that many, 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 of the, many of the scholars are saying that the intergenerational influence is really very strong on human lives, that it, uh, particularly in the extreme poor lives, that it creates an intergenerational cycle of growth failure or consistent growth failure, as mentioned by some of the scholars. And this process is really very complex, dynamic, and often reciprocal which really deserves special attention to understand uh, extreme poverty better and to tackle with this thing. Uh, let's move to the methodology, the way we have done this research. So we have analyzed uh, actually a qualitative longitudinal data set, 
which emerged as part of a pro extreme poverty graduation program for, in Bangladesh, which was uh, named uh, SHIRI. Uh, it extends to stimulating households improvements resulting in economic empowerment. It was uh, aiming to graduate 1 million extreme poor out of the extreme poverty, and it was funded by the UK aid, Swiss Development Corporation, and the government of Bangladesh. And there was this research component, which was mentored by the University of Bath. And under this research component, we have followed 72 households uh, over five year period. The number of follow-ups visits uh, for these households, because there were two cohorts that have been recruited in two different time periods. And we have uh, used two different tools to track those households. One was the baseline life history, and the other one is the reflection on intervention. The, for this research, we have analyzed only the life histories, not the reflection on the intervention. So this has to be clarified. And the life histories contains a, deta contains a detailed narrative of the crucial life, life events that happened in the lives of the extempo that we have uh, considered for this study. It is started from the child until the day of the interview of the first, uh, first interview. And there was also a life trajectory that we have developed to visualize the well-being status and events uh, on an events timeline. The research engaged participants from across the country, having deal with different geographical backgrounds like coastal areas, areas with seasonal food insecurity, river islands, wetlands, urban slums uh, in, in the hill tracks region. And it also includes people of different background also, like uh, disability, uh, old age, female headed, female managed, child level relying households among others. And there were 52 female participants and 20 male participants with an average age of 39 years. And majority of them had no formal education. Now, I know there might be some other questions regarding methodology, which can be clarified during the discussion if you have. Let's uh, move to the findings. What we have seen is uh, the life histories revealed a kind of common sense of disruption of, of accumulation uh, in, in skills and assets, and there were erosion of support, supportive social connections and networks, and the feeling of how their aspiration and dignity have been crippled, and how all this has led to a point of absolute deprivation. In the next couple of slides, I have tried to organize the findings based on five different um, sub-themes that emerge frequently from the data. These are ownership and inheritance of assets, poor health and nutrition, interrupted education and skills, inter-household relationships, and inter- and intergenerational bargain. Now, the last two, this is really very cross-cutting across the other three. And it is really very difficult to organize this um, as a separate issue. So, but we have tried to, um, we try to focus on this uh, as well. The successful accumulation um, uh, we have seen in terms of the in terms of the ownership um, and inheritance of assets that successful accumulation of and transfer of assets is one of the significant aspiration in the lives of the extreme poor. This is because if you see there are a limited number of assets that is owned by the multiple inheritors. Like for instance, there are five decimal of land that is in uh, that has been owned by the household, and there are three or four possible future inheritors uh, that that will uh, inherit this. A small piece of land. So the process is really very intense. And we have found that the male inheritance is clearly defined where there is strong gender differential treatment take place during this distribution and the bargaining process. And ultimately, the female and the younger and the weaker siblings become, become deprived, where the elder or the stronger counterparts influence and initiate decisions favoring their own gain. And for women, the transfer from parents to them happens mostly at the time of marriage as a form of gifts or dowry. And ultimately, they are deprived both the inheritance and the control over marriage dowry that has been transferred. So like, for instance, if you see Halima, who was required to marry a kind of, um, to a disabled man, so her brother could avoid to give dowry. She neither inherited, uh, she neither inherited the piece of land that their family have owned, and she neither received any share of other assets. In another case, Morium, for instance, her husband died in a road accident. She was denied by, by her in-laws to control the uh, amount that they received as compensation from the Transport Owners Association, because her father-in-law made an excuse that her husband had an overdue loan, which she was not aware of. 
there were frequent cases, uh, there, there, is, there is this evidence that there is the lack of assets, skills, and knowledge that restricts access to cash generating activities. But ultimately, because of this, they have to rely more on in-kind pay, living or bonded labor, or advanced sale of labor, low wage, and other kind of adverse means. This kind of adverse kind of situation or arrangement definitely give them short-term benefit, uh, giving support to them in their livelihoods and living. But ultimately, it brings complex long-term relationship and liabilities. There is this process that goes on, which is termed as the Faustian bargain by bargain by Geo Food, uh, where uh, they have to sacrifice something costly to meet the current needs. For example, sons are pulled out of school because employing time for their education is an immediate expense which the household cannot really afford. Now, using children as an instrument for livelihood is a kind of indicator of a severe forms of destitution. What happens here that perhaps they place the value of the women, girls, and children, children's future well-being below the value of their immediate well-being. And ultimately, in female-dependent households, children found to be more disadvantaged uh, position. But interestingly, in Chiriga Hill Tribes, which is one of the uh, one of the uh, area in um, uh, where the most of the indigenous population live, the tension this tension is really comparatively low. This is because the land, which is one of the most critical asset uh, for the simple household, the land is really communally inherited. There is no kind of uh, individual inheritance or individual ownership of land in this region. In terms of poor health and nutrition, it is quite evident that health-related disadvantages transmit from one generation to the next. And ultimately what happens is this kind of health-related disadvantages erodes the minimum asset the household really own, and it also erodes the future prospects and ability to work and earn generating some neg negative coping options. And ultimately, there are frequent concerns like ulcer, acidity, chest pain, and headache, for which they lost, uh, they lost a lot of work days around the year. And have, we, we have also found cases, frequent cases of asthma and tuberculosis, which are very common and passed from parents to children with the experience of stigma, social isolation, and exclusion for the whole households, creating a kind of uh, future, uh, um, future kind of tension for the households as, as well in terms of living and livelihood insecurity. And ultimately, most of them access low standard health services. Many of them have ignored the health concern or postponed treatment at an early stage of a, of a curable concern or were quite reluctant to create new expenses for the curable, curable concern, which later turned as kind, as kind of disastrous consequences for the whole household. And there are frequent cases of a stillbirth, child death, malnourishment, and self-reported no, low cognitive, cog, cognitive skills, uh, which were common. And in terms of all, in the geographical areas, children and heaters are more vulnerable health-wise uh, in that sense. In terms of the education and skills, what we have found that the formal education is perceived to bring not really much um, uh, short-term incentives for incentive for the households and children's enrolling in the school dependent on parents' background or perception about education. So ultimately, what happened that financial capacity is not really the uh, financial capacity is not really the sole reason for school enrollment or dropout from school. Like for instance, in Vidhan's case, he was really never encouraged to go to school. His father was a barber, and he believed that a barber's son needed no education. He, Ultimately, he was forced to uh, engage, uh, to learn the barber job as an assistant from a, when he was 10 years old. And this is quite a norm that is believed to be more beneficial for the entire family. On the other hand, for girls' education, it is determined by a specific set of factors. Like, you know, for, um, uh, for instance, uh, because early marriage requires a really less theory, and uh, the dowry is not really affordable for the households. So there are different kinds of factors that are impacting. And also for many girls, only ability to read holy books or ability to cook or to do household chores are really enough for them to learn. But the data that is there, it is also showing that even little level of education can facilitate supportive social networks and benefiting the entire households. Like for instance, Abida, 
who has got a little education of grade five. She has got the strength to fight the adverse situation. She has avoided all the multiple abusive relationship on her own. She took the challenge to work outside the home and continue the children's schooling and to live for her children with courage and confidence. Access to social safety nets and social protection schemes, uh, like conditional schemes like um, uh, cash for schooling or this kind of thing, it often incentivizes parents uh, to keep children enrolled in the school, particularly the girl child. Inter-household relationship. The relationship and networks are definitely significant determinant, determinant of the fortunes for the households which the children of the house inherit, inherit later. And in extreme poor households, we have found that they rely on multiple but fragile interpersonal arrangement for their survival and to maintain the livelihoods. And we have also seen that there are evidence of multiple marriages, abandonment, divorce that uh, that take place in the households, making the women and children more vulnerable. And men often remarry, expecting a male child, or if there is infertility, or the dowry expectation uh, not met. And ultimately, this often creates a kind of conflict and impact on the women, uh, impact on the mental and he mental health and women, uh, uh, well-being for, for the women and children of the previous marriage. Ultimately, the women have to play in a pre-existing patrilineal, patrilineal and patriarchal power dynamics that really reinforce the asymmetries through allocating resources, responsibilities, and obligations, which generate high level of stresses and low self-confidence. And women found to be the weakest and the most vulnerable member within the family with least bargaining power. And the, the tendency to have a male child uh, preference this really lead to kind of poorly spaced pregnancies and reduced agency over their bodies and in terms of food intake pregnancies and household chores. And we found also that there are a strong relationship between the gradual erosion of the joint family and the possibility to be extreme poor. In a large extreme poor family, uh, like most other, we have found that both the inter and intergenerational bargains can be intense. It can be a great source of anxiety, stress, and conflict also. In this bargaining, the relationship breaks, erodes, reform, or revives through different kinds of trade-offs toward towards an individual search for security. So ultimately, the senior and the most powerful and the knowledgeable in terms of education networks and skills, they really try to pursue their interests by abusing the younger and the most vulnerable. For instance, in case of Mintu, when he was 13, when his, when, uh, his father died, and ultimately his elder brother sell all the lands of the family and um, hide himself and keep the money to him. So Mintu, at that period, was really very young that he could not really understand what was happening, and he was left alone with his disabled mother surviving through child laboring. With all these findings and um, and this information, I mean, let's come to conclude uh, conclude the research. What we have tried to do in this uh, research is we examine the role of generational bargain and the transfer uh, and how it produces extreme poverty. And we have found that uh, there are high degrees of inter and intergenerational bargain that is impacting on children's well-being, and it also determines the access to future opportunities and possibilities for the child. This bargain risks the well-being of the children, women, older persons, disabled by imposing unfair, unfavorable means and arrangements on them. And thus, we have a, we, we get a kind of renewed understanding of, of extreme poverty in which this notion of bargain is central. And ultimately, poverty has to be seen as a kind of dynamic and relationship-laden phenomena for the households. One of the primary conclusions that we can draw here that extreme poverty is not only material, but to a large extent, relational. And this transmission of poverty is really outcome of an unequal social relation that persists in these extreme poor households. Ultimately, what we have found in this research that matches with the concept of subsistence poverty and status poverty, as mentioned by C. Jewis in his, in his uh, article, uh, where he was saying that subsistence poverty, it really leads to status poverty, and ultimately, subsistence poverty is easily resolv resolvable. What makes it difficult when it turns 
to status poverty. And that has to be kept in mind when we uh, keep working on action poverty. And this process is not only intergenerational, but also intragenerational, which is not really that much focused in the traditional literature that we have got. And the whole process is highly gendered, which is obvious. And um, even in male-headed households, we have seen the transfer of disadvantages depended on the status and the position of the mother in the family. And uh, ultimately, this all this point towards that the escape from extreme poverty ought to be conceived as highly strongly, uh, highly, I mean, strongly political. And all these multifaceted experiences suggest that interventions must be designed in a way that considers how project beneficiaries are relationally embedded and how this significantly determines their ability and respond to a project. And all this analysis uh, contributes to the existing knowledge base on extreme poverty and their, their roots, which are really important to understand and to tackle the problem of extreme poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Avasim, very much for this interesting presentation full of information um, for the ones who came late. Um, before we will dive into the discussion, I have a few questions for you. Um, as I said in the beginning, the common classification of extreme poverty is an economic one. The ones who have less than 1.90 US uh, per day are classified as extreme poor. The World Bank is working with this classification. And the United Nations, Nations also use them within the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. You're going with a different classification, with a social one. Where do you see your classification in this whole area of, of poverty research or poverty, poverty um, development policy? As a supplement or as a replacement? How would you, um, where would you put it? I think I would put it as a kind of supplement and a complement because you know you cannot definitely ignore all these factors. Ultimately, when you try to access or recruit a participant for extreme poverty graduation program, you have to definitely go through this kind of uh, materialistic understanding of poverty. And then, what is important that we, I mean, having this as a kind of background, we have to understand more about the process. Otherwise, you do not really know the systematic roots to poverty. And by this. Like in my understanding, I mean, unofficially, I don't know, unofficially or informally, I would like to say that, I mean, even if you find a kind of particular households with a kind of having lower income threshold or maybe upper income threshold, when you really interact with them, you really find them either more vulnerable or less vulnerable. So you see there is a contrasting picture when you really try to engage and to, to, to know more about the lived experience. So for instance, in a disabled household, if a disabled person owns a land of like one acre of land, productive land, but if he, and you, you just categorize him based on the inheritance of the land, you really put him in a different category, which maybe he is non poor. But if you really try to access how he is living, how, what time, whether he, he has really the control over the resources or assets, then you really find it differently. So these kind of indicators can, can create a kind of confusion in terms of understanding who are real poor or who are not really, really poor, or they might have experienced it differently. So the lived experience is really very important. That is what we are trying to argue here. Mm -hmm. And I would also like to um, us to focus a little bit on this, on these dimensions, on the categorization of the scales of human conditions you used in your research. It's, um, you said it in the beginning, beginning it's uh, food and nutrition, it's the acceptance in the society, it's the assets. How did you develop this categorization? Are you following a common model or is this a new way of looking at poverty? Uh, ultimately, we have uh, really benefited from a lot of work that has been done by Chronic Poverty Research Center, as we have seen. So particularly the uh, well-being trajectory that we ha I have adopted in the article, maybe many of you have seen there, and the list of the well-being categories and the categorization for each of them. It has been based on from the data that we have got, actually. So it's a kind of, we can say, uh, it's a kind of coming uh, from the data. And also we have modified it from the what is what has happened earlier from the research of chronic poverty research center that has been acknowledged in the research. So that's how it has been developed. And you also uh, said in the beginning, the area of your research is widely spread in Bangladesh. It's from yes. the coastal areas till the, the north. 
So I assume it's in rural areas as well as in urban slum settings? Yes, yes. In rural areas, people often have at least a kitchen garden or some other form of subsistence farming. To mm -hmm. what extent can subsistence farming mitigate poverty for households in the rural areas? Now, what we have to keep in mind here that we are discussing about extreme poor, not really poor. And that is really very interesting. For extreme poor, they are extremely poor in poverty. And what the maximum they have, the, the maximum they can have the home is land. And that's all. So you, they do not, many of them, I think most of them doesn't really have that pleasure of having this homestead gardening and this kind of thing. So this is, this is what also is important to know how it has been categorized from this poor to uh, non-poor to extreme poor. This is also very important. So I think that this is not a, not the case there. So would you say there are significant differences between rural and urban extreme poverty, according to your indicators? Uh, there are definitely, definitely, because we are not exploring here urban poverty, definitely. Even if we have uh, 10 uh, urban uh, participants there, but mostly because, you know, we have adopted these life histories to, to really generate these findings and uh, research. And even if we're trying to know from them their experiences, they are actually reflecting their rural experiences, if you see, because they are not really permanently uh, you know, based in the urban area. And we have said that we are um, making this research from the life histories uh, tool, not from the uh, our, uh, reflection on the intervention. So most of the experiences that have been shared by the urban participants, these are also based on the rural experiences also. But definitely the people who are doing research on extreme poverty in urban areas, I trust that this is, there is a huge difference between uh, these two phenomena. Mm -hmm. um, according to, to the SDG 1, the gap between the wealthy, the rich pre, um, populations and the poor populations of the world, they become ever larger, becomes ever larger. Which findings of your research or your methodological parts or outcome can be easily used for poverty research in countries besides Bangladesh? Do you have any recommendations here? Or is this so individual for Bangladesh? I think it has to be like, um, it has to be context, uh, contextual. And because you know, the extreme poverty in, in the countries like America cannot be similar uh, like in Bangladesh. Although there is extreme poverty in all the countries in different forms and different standards. So it has to be definitely inside. But the roots that we have shown here, it definitely has something to do for all societies. It is definitely uh, this, how this inter, because Ultimately, we are splitting from families or we are gaining or inheriting something from the family. So these roots can, and this kind of, uh, can indicate how it can be contextualized within a certain country context. Definitely. Okay, before I go on with my questions, I have still a few more. Um, I will give our audience the possibility to ask questions as well. You can ask them via voice. You can switch on your microphone if you want. You can type them in the chat room. Um, if you haven't switched it on, it's on the bottom of your screen. There, the symbol for chat, you, then you can um, type it. You can also switch on your camera if you want to be seen during your comments. Are there any questions or comments? I think I'll give the audience the time to, <laughs> to type them maybe. So I have um, more questions. The poverty has been for decades and still is subject to intensive research in Western countries as well as in the so-called global south. What possibilities do, do you see for the practical use of your research? For example, for the European Development um, Corporation. No, I mean, definitely, I mean, I see a lot of possibilities in terms of using these findings in terms uh, for the development actors. And because I was engaged with the European Commission in Bangladesh, I know how this research are really benefiting them to for the designing of the program of their programs and the means of support or aid to the country in, in consultation with the partners and the people who are really implementing the program. And, um, and that's how, and particularly this research is not really coming as an isolated academic research. It is coming from something that we are making a trial on. So it's a kind of trial and error process, and that's how we learn. And through this research, we have really, uh, I mean, it's, it's just one piece, but it, within the CD research program, we have done a lot of researches that are really bringing important dimensions and really lessons and learning 
to really modify programs that can really benefit the extreme poverty more and ultimately the uh, problems can be addressed. And ultimately, uh, the uh, DFID and the other, do, uh, other development partners like European Union and other, they are taking benefit of this kind of research and reshaping their ideas of the extreme poverty for their program. Yeah. Um, Mama Nisufu, do you have a question? You wrote in the chat. Hi. Nice to have you here. If you have a question, you can switch on your microphone if you want, or you can type it. Okay, um, I, oh, okay, there is a question. Um, financial capacity plays an important role in dropping out of school and remain the main factor in rural Niger because with less than a dollar a day, families cannot support their children. Is, is it just a comment or do you want to ask a question as well? Oh, no, maybe I can relate it with the yeah. findings that I have shared. Uh, I assume that this is a comment. And yeah. uh, what you've seen, like I have tried to mention that financial capacity is not the sole reason behind dropout or not enrolling in school, as I have mentioned in, in Vidan's case. Because the family really, they calculate the immediate benefit. And ultimately in my paper, if it, because we cannot really share everything that we have said in the paper, but ultimately the family calculates that what happens, you know, who are educated within the community? Because ultimately in, the, in, the, in a society where there is high level of corruption, where there is high level of competition, ultimately the people from those kind of background who are educated, they cannot really do much out of their education. They do not get really, like better jobs and other things. So this is how they calculate this. So what is the point then to enroll the children in the school? Although we have found this kind of evidence because this cannot, this cannot really be associated by the family members that how education really benefit them in the long, long run. So ultimately what they do, they take the benefit of the immediate out, uh, outcome of engaging the children in kind of care work and, uh, and, and all other kind of income generating activities and definitely. But, this capacity, financial capacity is not really the sole reason of not engaging children uh, in the school or enrolling children in school. Definitely. Thank you, Maman, for your comment and the insight in the, in the situation in rural Niger. Um, Ovasim, you worked for the European, develop, European Union Development um, Corporation for three years. Um, what is your opinion of the existing development cooperation policy of the Euro European Union? Is it sufficient to achieve the SDG 1, the eradication of all poverty by 2030? Uh, I think this is really very critical questions, but what is important that I have seen in Bangladesh is the government is not relying on this kind of development cooperation much, at, at least particularly in terms of grants or aid. And this is, this is quite really a positive sign at the same time. So what is what we have seen like 20 years back, there was high reliance on this kind of development aid or uh, financial aid by the development partners. But ultimately, if you see the whole budget of a government, it's kind of peanut. The budget of the development corporation is nothing. It's, it's less than even 1% of the whole budget that the government is spending. But ultimately, the development partners definitely create a kind of important role in terms of shaping policies, in terms of understanding the context in terms of uh, advocacy and other things. Where is, ultimately, the, rest, where is the rest of the budget coming? It's Before coming the... from, from either, either it's, it's coming from mostly from the taxpayers' money. It's coming from maybe as a loan. They prefer loan rather than in grants, which is also good in a sense. So ultimately, I think the whole responsibility lies on how the government is really taking this forward. And ultimately, the whole responsibility goes on. And uh, maybe in sooner future, maybe the development partners have to have a kind of different role. I have seen a kind of very uh, important shift in, in, in the Bangladesh that the governments, uh, the donor development partners are really moving to support to the treasury rather than through kind of different kind of NGOs or international NGOs or other development partners, partners to work from a kind of, from a different angle. So this is also a kind of shift that uh, earlier, like I, we have seen the 20 years back or even 10 years back, we have seen there were growing reliance on the NGOs to use this money from the development partner. partner. So this is shifting. We have another question. Oh, we have another two questions. The first one from Sofia Alexopoulou. 
I have, I would have asked that one as well. Based on your research, what is the best way to break this vicious circle of inter and intergenerational dimension of extreme poverty? If you were a policymaker in your country, what would you do in order to address the pro problem of extreme poverty? Uh, in this research, I, I, I definitely would say that uh, we are not pointing out all the solutions here. But one lesson that we can draw from the head that we should have a kind of intergenerational approach in terms of tackling poverty, which is not really yet evident in, in different programs that so far I have seen. So this kind of intergenerational approach should be there when we plan any kind of development program. This is one of the crucial learning that we have got from this research, at least for the time being. Sophia, is the question answered for you? If not, you can go on. Yes, in the... yes it is answered. Hi. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was really interesting to hear you all this time. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Hi, Sophia. And we have another question from Timo Seppele. Thank you very for an excellent presentation. What do you think are the main impacts of the current pandemic on poverty in Bangladesh, especially from the perspective of the, of the urban poor? For example, in what ways will the pandemic widen the already existing forms of inequality? Oh, no, this is really very critical. I'm not, I mean, in kind, this kind of emergency situation, where I have not have any experience. How does it work in kind of humanitarian situation? But I'm trying to explore how does it impact from, I mean, reading the newspaper articles and other commentaries that we have now on. But definitely what I have come to know from my non-empirical perspective, I would say, it's not about the pandemic of the virus, it's about pandemic of hunger and food insecurity and livelihood insecurity. Because in that sense, the government, any kind of government has to play kind a kind of sensitive role that what kind of policies they should have taken. Because ultimately, with this lockdown that is currently going on in Bangladesh, I think um, uh, more than 20 million people are running the risk to become a new kind of extreme poor. So how the country would really uh, bear the consequences for, for the future, that is also important to think. So in this kind of situation, I think the government should have a kind of proper analysis of the situations, proper analysis of what options gives really optimal outcome or uh, for, for, for if we decide different options, whether it is option B or option A or option C. So this has to be researched definitely. Um, because this was a kind of sudden issue, the government was not prepared, the whole world was not prepared to be. And uh, I think this also generates some extra lessons for all the countries to tackle poverty as well as this kind of pandemic. This is yet to see. Tina, I hope your question is answered. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, then I would like to set the focus a little bit. Um, again, you had it in your presentation that the feminization of poverty and the gender issue is a very, very big one. Um, it is already in the discourse also since 30 to 40 years, this feminization of poverty. What is the background in Bangladesh for that? You said it a little bit, maybe also you can focus a little bit on the men who are leaving home, on the migration workers, on this. Was this an issue in your um, research? Uh... Would you, like, would you please reframe the questions me to understand me better? Um, can you, can you um, point out or reframe this, this gender aspect in, the, um, in, in poverty in Bangladesh and also the relation between men and women, a husband and wife, and that the impact from that on the poverty situation? I think uh, this gender issue was there across all the countries um, in the world. And there is this feminization of poverty, and this is quite evident in, in our research as well. But definitely the norms and the practices are being changed. It is it's being const continuously changed. It, it depends on, on different kinds of policies as well. The government is taking it depends on the growing modernizations and the industrialization we have seen. We have seen this, um, the growth of government's industries in Bangladesh, where the 90% of them are workers uh, from the rural uh, areas and they are women. So this, this is definitely changing, but it depends on, I don't know whether it would be even lasting debate on this uh, 
feminization of poverty. But even within this development, there are different trends are getting in place, taking place uh, to, to where, which is making the women more vulnerable and to, and to be more insecure in their, uh, in their lives. But um, this is, I mean, we know a lot about this feminization of poverty, definitely, and we still keep researching on this issue because this is this is a change. There is a changing trends, and within this changing trend, there are other dimensions that are taking place. But it depends on definitely how policies and how the development partners and the government is really trying to uh, trying to tackle this. I don't know whether I answered your questions. I really found mm -hmm. it really very broad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have another comment. Yeah, we have another comment. Um, I will, um, Angel, Angel, I hope you, you ex um, excuse me that I'll take another one first, reshaping the moderator question. What about the marriage market norms and rules and their impact on poverty? Mm. Uh, what about the marriage market? How I would say the marriage market? the norms and rules and their impact on poverty. It has definitely still uh, the impact, like we, we discuss a lot about this story and other things, and there is this shaming game now that is going on, that naming and shaming those who are receiving dowry or other kind of gifts from. Now it has a kind of taken a different culture. So it's now more coming as a gift, not really in the forms of dowry. And it is definitely impacting, I mean, in across all societies, no matter whether it is poor or uh, non-poor or moderate poor, but although there is there are two different campaigns that is definitely going on, but large part of uh, this is going on through kind of informal means. You know, people are not saying. I don't know whether I should this kind of, should say this kind of non-empirical observation, but it's still what I observe that people are not really saying formally, which I have seen before, that we have this 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 kind of demand. So now there is no. They're not really expressing it, but it is somehow you know, inherent when you arrange a kind of uh, marriage. So this, this is also making it more difficult for the for, for because you cannot really satisfy people from, I, I don't know, from any kind of arrangement that you have taken. But these norms and rules are definitely changing in the societies in the growing, uh, because there are more number of people and the children, they're, they're getting educated the number of educated people are really increasing. So it really needs to change uh, the whole scenery, but it's, it's, it's getting towards the positive side. And there is another question. Thanks for waiting, Angel. Um, as you mentioned before, I think it's better the loan than the grant when it comes to, the bu to budget development from Europe, for instance. Can you be more specific about that? I'm always struggling to understand the differences between th these two actions. Um, and now this is this really requires a lot of time. So what I mean in summary, in summary, what I, I what I was saying that because in the grants is coming, who provides grants or you, you can say kind of for a state level charity, I would say. So the, the one particular donor or development partner is offering as a kind of charity, which is definitely more indignified way of you know dealing with it. So ultimately. There is this financial partners like um, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and others, and some other governments who have these loan facilities. So if even if they need it, they can definitely have this through this means because ultimately you have to pay it back with some forms of interest and other things. But maybe in terms of having this, there are definitely other factors. But in terms of this dignity, where this kind of charity or grant is really less. Um, it's perceived to be less worth to have it from development partners. Mm -hmm. Is your question answered, Angel? Um, another question for me, there's one adoption in the Western world that poor people live more in the present from day to day and therefore they cannot plan ahead for the future. Is this a Western preacher this, or is this something you also recognize in your research? Uh, for me, I think it's about it's about the concept of welfare. I would say because you know in our countries there is there the concept of welfare is not really there. Like in this pandemic, there is no formal security 
for those people. It's not even for the middle class people. And many of the middle class are really turning to be kind of poor or kind of extreme poor after this pandemic because they are losing their jobs and there is no formal protection from, from, from the state level. And, and if you see about the pension system, like particularly for the older person who are one of the most vulnerable that I'm trying to explore during this pandemic, is um, who, are, who are the pension owners? They're mostly the public employees, which are only 3%. So that means 97% people are not really having any kind of pension. There is this old age allowance, which is really nothing. And they, these are only transferred to a certain group of people or maybe a very smaller portion. So ultimately, it's about how welfare is perceived within a system. And that is really very important. Uh, I would not really try to bring this debate as no, no, Western or non-Western. So for me, like ultimately, for the welfare of the whole nation, it lies on the responsibility of the government, how they really perceive the welfare of the people or human dignity or human rights of the people. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Then I'll have a last one and I'm known for my critical questions. <laughs> ah, just a second, please. Miriam wants to ask. Yeah, we're waiting for you. So, Avasim, can you hear him? Uh, it's breaking. The sound is breaking, I think. Yeah, now you're gone. I'm sorry. Okay, then I'll, um, I'll ask Miriam's question first. You showed the importance of bargaining and household relations in the intergenerational transmission of extreme poverty. Do you think those findings can be generalized to the transmission of socioeconomic status in general in Bangladesh? Example, given our similar process processes at work, when you would look at the moderate poor or when you study the lower earning non-poor? Uh, it can be generalized definitely to, a, to, a, to an extent, but for this research, we have considered only the extreme poor. But I see, I mean, I'm from a middle class family and I have, I, I am, I'm from a kind of extended family. I have seen my parents to live with, a, with my uncles and others. And I see the, how the process is going on. This is definitely, the tension is there definitely in, in every family is there. But what is specific about this research that this tension is even more intense in the extreme poor family. Because as I have said, there are limited resources. Because if you see the example there, that five decimal lakh, it has to be shared to three persons or three future inheritors. Compared to kind of a person in middle class family who have three acres land, maybe shared to two persons. So if you see, the tension here is really pretty much very intense compared to those kind of things. But maybe in future research, we can, we can see how this contrast look like. But for this research, we are focused mostly on extreme poverty. I don't know whether I have answered the question, but this is how I should perceive. Okay, great. Um, the person who wanted to ask a question before, maybe you want to try it again? Okay, then I'll go first. Um, as you just said, you're from a middle class um, family from Bangladesh. You're living now in Europe for quite a while now in Sweden, which is a rather rich country also for Europe. Um, how do you see the poverty discussion in the Western world? Is it a lux luxury problem in a comparatively comparatively rich society, or is it sufficiently serious, maybe even comparable to the situation in Bangladesh? You mean the situation of poverty in Sweden? Uh, or in Europe as, uh, in general. Oh, okay. No, I mean, definitely the, there is a qualitative difference in terms of the poverty experience in Bangladesh and uh, in Sweden, or maybe countries like that. I, w I always discuss with my colleagues that here, you really try to improve your situation, but there we survive for food. So there is this basic differences between there. And ultimately here we see some sort of, you know, responsibility from the state side also. Like, you know, I, I, I'm benefiting from child allowance. I, if, I, if I have no job, I can get something sorts of unemployment allowance. And during this pandemic, the government is providing a lot of incentives and other issues to protect the businesses, to protect the people. But there, we are also doing there, but it's nothing in a compared to the need and particularly a population in a country where the population size of 170 million compared to a country where there is 10 million or a little bit more than 10 million. You can see uh, there is a huge difference between the means and, 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 and there are a lot of challenges that is uh, 
uh, there between these two countries. There is definitely this qualitative difference uh, that mm -hmm. is visible. We have another, another comment from Maman. I think that in many countries, development policies are not designed to end this vicious circle. For example, instead of investing in agriculture, we prefer to distribu distribute cereals to people. This plunges the poor into extreme poverty. You want to answer to that? Um, not really. This is again a comment. And this is definitely, it means a lot how development policies are really meant to uh, and how the people who really need it most are being reached. So this is really very important question. So, so ultimately, we, that's why you know, our research always targets to reach the policies, how the policies can be better informed with more evidence and more arguments and more rational. And this kind of research definitely contributes in that sense. So miles to go. Absolutely. Not only miles, are there more questions to go? <laughs> Okay, I think all the questions are answered by now. Then we have come to the end of this webinar on generational transfer of disadvantages and extreme poverty in Bangladesh. A big thanks to you, Ovasim, for taking this time to present your research on this webinar and helping more people to understand the realities in Bangladesh. Also thanks to anyone who joined us this afternoon and who participated and for all your questions and comments. This was a very, uh, very viral, very lively discussion. I thank you for that. And the thanks to Doris uh, for hosting this um, session also. Thank you. The Yadi webinar series will go on. So please look out for it on the Yadi website and on our social media channels on Facebook and Twitter. I hope we will read and see some of you again soon. Thank you to all and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.